Welcome to Chapter 4 where we'll be talking about population genetics and natural selection. During Chapter 4 I'll be talking about uh, Darwin and Gregor Mendel and how their work kind of interacted in order to explain some of the variation that we see within populations and we'll talk about the Heidi Hardy Weinberg formula and natural selection and the changes that result from that and then the impact of microevolution on agriculture and our use of things like pesticides. We start out by talking about Darwin. Here is a young man who sailed across the Atlantic to explore South America. He was the naturalist on the ship called the Beagle and as he was looking at the different animals in South America he noticed that there were there was quite a variation amongst the the same species of animals and this really came to a head when he visited the Galapagos Islands which was about a thousand miles off the coast of Peru and there he saw similar species species to what he was seeing on the mainland but they had very different characteristics and he started thinking about this and um, trying to figure out what it all meant his idea was that there was gradual change in organisms that occurred over time and then he got at well what might be some of the mechanisms that are driving this gradual change. So Darwin eventually developed his theory of natural selection and the basic idea is that organisms reproduce and produce other organisms that are very much like themselves. But there is chance variation between individuals and that some of these variations can be inherited from one generation to the next and that as there are more offspring than an environment can hold or can support because of a limitation of resources that means some of the individuals are going to die and the key here is that those individuals that are best adapted or best suited for an environment based on the particular variations that they have will survive in that environment. So you end up with this idea of the, the survival of the fittest. In this way the dominant individuals in a population or the most abundant individuals in a population have the characteristics that are best suited for changes in the environment and the population itself can survive over time. It's important to understand that the changes that Darwin is talking about really occur in populations. It's not just within an individual, it's the population and the dominant individuals or most abundant individuals in that population. Darwin was never able to get at the mechanisms behind inheritance, but about the time that he was making his discoveries, um, a monk named Gregor Mendel, who you've probably studied about in your genetics class or are about to study, um, did some investigations with the pea plant and discovered these unique packets of information that are passed on from one generation to the next and you could mathematically calculate what the phenotype or the external characteristics of particular plants would be based on the parents and from this was developed the idea of alleles and then eventually genes which really provides the, the background for this um, variation by chance idea that was essential to Darwin's theory of natural selection.
book then provides several examples of variation within plant and animal populations. And it's good to read through these and understand this, and also to uh, get an idea of how the, the formula works for calculating the frequency of alleles in populations that was developed by Hardy Weinberg. But the real important thing is to understand that for this formula to work, it has certain assumptions. And those are that there is a totally random mating, that there are no mutations in the population, that the population is very, very large, and that there's no immigration into the population from outside areas. And also that all of the genotypes have an equal chance of surviving. Now it's obvious that there aren't any populations that meet these assumptions. And so you can use this formula in order to try to figure out which of these assumptions are not occurring in a particular population and get some idea of the, the source of the change in the population. Maybe it's coming from the fact that there are a lot of mutations that are occurring, or perhaps it's coming from the fact that you're just looking at a small remnant of a population. So we get some idea of what the driving factor might be in changing the population by evaluating the, the formula and looking at what assumptions are not being met. So now we can understand a little bit better that um, natural selection is working in a population on those individuals that have different degrees or different possibilities for survival depending on the environment. So fitness can be defined as uh, an individual's ability to survive and produce offspring and basically have its genes carried on to the next generation. So natural selection then is a force that can work against certain phenotypes and the, the phenotypes are an expression of a set of genes. So the selection can work against a set of genes or characteristics and reduce those in a population, or it can enhance some of them if they're particularly beneficial in, in a certain environment. So we can see changes in the population resulting from changes in the environment. And we'll be looking next at uh, some graphs that will explain how generally some of these changes occur and what, what direction natural selection can push the population. In our first graph, we see a situation where the, the majority of the individuals in the population are very well suited to the current conditions in the environment. And so, those individuals that are different, that's those around on either edge in the red shaded area, are selected against. And those that are similar to the majority in the population are selected for. And so the population is stable. This doesn't eliminate variation in the population. It just reinforces those individuals that have the, the most popular characteristics in the population is those that occur the most. Our next example is called directional selection because the population or the majority of the individuals in the population are pushed in a particular direction. In this case, there's a benefit for the organisms to have a larger body size. And so the small segment of the population that you see in the left graph becomes the, the group that's selected for. And so over time, this becomes the, the most common 
group in the population. So more of the individuals develop a large body size because the large body size allow, allows them to survive more effectively in this new changed environment. So you see the, the graph for the, the curve shifting to the right. In the third example, those individuals in the population um, that have the median body size are selected against that individuals on both ends of the population spectrum, the size spectrum in the population, are selected for. So there's a benefit to being small and there's a benefit to being large, but those that are in the intermediate size range are selected against and they don't survive to reproduce and so their numbers are reduced in the population and you end up with a population that has greater diversity of characteristics. This could actually lead to a situation where um, there's a, a split in the species and it could lead to either two very different types within a species or it could lead to something we call speciation, which we'll be talking about later, where there's a development of a new species resulting from this division in the existing species. Changes in a population due to natural selection really depend on the heritability of particular phenotypes or traits. And that heritability can be expressed as the formula that you see here, where VG stands for the genetic variance and VP the phenotypic variance. And this can range from the one to, to zero. In the situation where the phenotype variation is determined purely by the environment and not by genetic variation, then that wouldn't be inherited, it wouldn't be passed on, because the only way characteristics can be passed on is if they result from gene expression. If all the variation of a particular characteristic is the result, result of a genetic variation, then H squared would be 1, um, since all of variation is due to genetic variation. The other important thing is that the gene expression ha has to uh, come out in order to uh, show the phenotype. So if you have a recessive gene paired with a dominant gene, then the recessive won't be expressed. And so it's not possible for natural selection to act on that gene. Only the, those genes that are expressed in the phenotype can be affected by natural selection. The book then goes on to give you some examples of adaptive changes in various populations of animals and talks about genetic drift and the change in gene frequencies and the importance of habitat in that process, and then leads you into a discussion about agriculture and how natural selection and evolution have really affected the domestication of plants and animals over time through artificial selection or breeding, and more recently, genetic engineering where genes have been introduced or removed from various plants or animals in order to enhance them, maybe increase production or make them easier to harvest or uh, provide some resistance to pests. We call these genetically modified organisms or GMOs. And you've probably heard some of the controversy surrounding the use of of products uh, that have been genetically modified. Use of chemicals in order to protect 
the nuts from predation by various insects has really provided an interesting example of natural selection and a very frustrating one for farmers because uh, plants like weeds and animals that are pests have become resistant to the chemicals that the farmers have used in order to get rid of them and then they have to switch to a new chemical and then they become resistant to that and it's all the same process of natural selection that we've been talking about where the population has a, a diversity of traits and those traits that allow it to survive even though the pesticide is there will become the dominant trait in a population and then we say that that population is now resistant to that particular pesticide. So we see this happening over and over again, and that's why some farmers have gone to genetically modified organisms that they don't have to use pesticides to preserve. So the key take-home messages for this chapter, then, are the interaction between Darwin and Mendel, even though um, Darwin didn't really know about what Mendel was doing, but um, subsequently the way that Mendel's work blended in very nicely to explain what Darwin was developing in terms of his theory of natural selection, and then to understand that this process of natural selection works on populations. And it's, it's based on the idea that there is natural variation in populations, and that variation is tied to variation in genes. And that, that comes through mutations and other errors that might occur during meiosis, another term that you probably learned in genetics, and that uh, allele frequencies can be measured with a formula and that looking at that formula in terms of its assumptions can help you to interpret how natural selection is working in a particular population. It's, in, it's very important to understand that change in genetic frequencies is due to chance and that this has really impacted agriculture in terms of resistance of pests to various chemicals that are used as pesticides. So those are the, the key thoughts that you should really focus on in this chapter.